like he said, it boils down to how are we going to progress and advance our students? Hey there, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 417. Today we're talking about teaching blended martial arts styles. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, the founder of Whistlekick, and a guy who spends as much possible time training as possible. Well, that was an awkward way to say it, but I'm going to leave it because sometimes life is awkward. If you want to see all the awkward <laughs> and cool things that we're doing here at Whistlekick, you could go to whistlekick.com. You can find them. You can find the store where we sell some things, and you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off all of those things. If you want to know more about this show, that's got a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there. You can check out all of the past episodes. You can find transcripts, links to things like the guests. And in fact, we have two guests today who came on to help me talk about this very subject. Some of you know that I used to teach martial arts. I used to have my own school. And now my instruction is limited to my travels and the occasional teaching at the schools that I train in. But over the last 20 th years or so, martial arts and the lines between styles have gotten a little blurry, and it continues to get even blurrier. But how do you handle teaching that blurriness? Do you just develop your own new style and give it a name? Do you teach those things independently and expect students to achieve rank in each of them separately? There are a lot of different ways to handle this, and plenty of good and bad to each. Well, today I have two guests who are partners in a martial arts school, and they are facing this very challenge. And so I invited them on to talk about it so we could have a conversation about how they handle it in their school. So let's welcome them to the show. Sensei Nate, Sensei Eric, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Good morning. Thank you. Well, it is a Glad pleasure to, to have you both on. And of course, we're, we're probably going to stumble a little bit at times because there are three of us and, and listeners. If you've ever had a conversation on the phone with more than one person, maybe a conference call or something, you know that that isn't always easy to do. And if I, I heard you guys correctly as we were getting set up, you're not in the same room. Did I no, okay. I'm, in, no. Uh, I'm in our weight room and uh, Eric is in our office. Okay. Usually yeah. when we have multiple guests, they're sitting in the same space. So this is an opportunity for me to kind of flex some of my interview host muscles in a way that I haven't before. So I appreciate that opportunity. And uh, just make sure you don't say anything that makes one of you, you know, throw the mic down and run in the other room and start <laughs> rolling or, you know, anything like that. But if you do, make sure you capture the audio well. That's all I ask. Got it. Got it. <laughs> well, cool. Well, you know, we started talking over email, of course, uh, a few weeks ago with the idea that the two of you are doing something that, you know, honestly, it, it happens all the time across the country, I assume across the world, in that you are incorporating multiple martial arts styles into the curriculum that you teach. And yet, as we were talking about, it, I realized we've not really talked much about that. So I thought it was a great opportunity for us to get to know the two of you, of course, and, and you know, hear some about your martial arts journey, but also talk about the, the ups, the downs, the pros and cons of how you start combining things in such a way that a student doesn't have to feel overwhelmed or conflicted with what they're being taught. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it is. And it's, um, you know, as we discussed before, you know, with the mixed martial arts and blended martial arts that is coming, it's not uncommon I don't know, probably less common with some of our, the traditional aspect that we're combining, but it is, it's, there's, it's definitely interesting. And I think I, for, for me, I think it's just fun, really. It's been a super exciting and a opportunity that I didn't know if I was ever going to come across. And uh, now that, now that I've, you know, come to know Nate and working with him, um, I think his humility and just being able to openly discuss and not shy away from having a real talk has made it all the much easier to, uh, to make this happen in reality. Awesome. Well, let's let's take a couple minutes for each of you. Talk about how you started in martial arts and what it is that you're bringing in to this blending that you're creating together. Uh, Eric has uh, the most consistent long-term long training 
uh, from the traditional young age. So I'll let him go first. Absolutely. Um, I grew up in Houston. I was born in Chicago. And um, I think I took a one month or one week pass from one of my buddies in kindergarten in a Taekwondo school. And they had a good reputation, had been around for many years and had a association in the greater Houston area. And I was enjoying it. Absolutely loved it. Um, outtrained the buddy who invited me and a couple of friends who went on for a couple of years uh, until about the age of eight and was really enjoying it. Loved the physicality, um, loved the individual aspect. I had been doing some other team sports, but this is the one thing I knew, you know, when I got there, I was going to get all 45 minutes of game time or play time, as it were. Um, so that was one of the things that really draw me in or drew me into the martial arts. Um, it was about eight, eight and a half when I moved into the intermediate kids class where I was working with one instructor in particular. And it was his um, demeanor more than anything. He wasn't mean, but just his overall laissez-faire attitude that kind of had me waning, um, wanting more and looking for a little bit more inspiration, I guess. Um, and I, in not so many words, told my mom and dad this. And my dad uh, was visually impaired, so we didn't have a lot of options as far as um, getting to and from another school. So we were pretty limited to things right in our, our area. So we decided one day to take a walk around the block and check out the, the school that just said martial arts. They were in a strip center less than 10 houses away from uh, my childhood home and ended up taking an intro and showing the instructor what I knew. And I think within 10 minutes, my dad and I uh, had some sidebar and were really impressed with what was going on so this instructor ended up being my sensei my business coach my life mentor up until my 27th birthday when i quit on my 12 year anniversary of hiring um so grew up doing a traditional martial art called kuksul um korean based and incorporates a lot of the uh, militaristic you know weaponry um from the korean history and then also a lot of joint locking um what people would consider very, uh, you know, traditional, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Jiu-jitsu, stand-up, Japanese jiu-jitsu, um, acupressure and things like that. And just the, the complexity, I guess, for some can be overwhelming, but it was something I was extremely drawn to. And I was very fortunate to have the instructor and guidance that I did. And in, in short, that's where I come from. Okay, so, you know, doesn't sound that, off from what a lot of the listeners are, are likely, you know, their experience sounds fairly similar to my own. Right. So, yeah. All right. Okay. One down, one to go. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a, what a lot of call late bloomer martial artist. Uh, I grew up playing traditional sports, uh, in the Midwest, West, uh, Southwest Ohio from a small town. I uh, grew up playing soccer, uh, running track, so pretty much doing traditional sports year-round, you know, including indoor soccer, um, all the way until this summer before my senior year in high school, uh, started dating a girl who was training in martial arts, and, uh, you know, I'm a few years, quite a few uh, of Eric, so, you know, I'm from the generation of going to see Karate Kid in the theater, and, uh, you know, growing up with the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, and the old cheesy 80s martial arts films, you know, remembering blood sport and all those. So martial arts always interested me. And I always wanted to, but uh, my family couldn't really afford it. But come the summer before my senior year, you know, I've been working a couple summer jobs. I started uh, training martial arts without a lot of fanfare or sharing to others. And, uh, Met my instructor who came from kind of a non traditional uh, martial arts upbringing himself. He originally started in Shaolin and went, worked into Shotokan. And uh, even though I'd went to college, I continued uh, to train and wound up transferring to college a half an hour away. I uh, got my Shotokan black belt. And then we also taught a Japanese style of jiu-jitsu, very close to Aikido, Aiki jiu-jitsu, and uh, trained there through uh, 
the early 2000s. Uh, I moved to San Diego in 2008, took a hiatus from training for a while to do the you know, SoCal lifestyle, race motorcycles, or uh, but in 2014, uh, I laid off from my corporate job, uh, started doing fitness as a full-time career, got hired to teach at a Tong Sudo school, trained in Tong Sudo for two years, and then two years after that, decided to completely do my own thing and go back to kind of my original Shotokan base. And that's what we use as our forms base now between myself and Eric. We use uh, traditional Shotokan form. Okay, nice, nice. And how did the two of you meet? Uh, <laughs> Interesting story. Um, yeah. I, I after um, quitting my job in September 2017, went on tour with my buddy's band. I was good friends with a couple guys who went to Berkeley, and I was at a wedding with one of them and having drinks after the ceremony and told him, you know, wasn't sure what I was going to do for the next few months. My goal had always been to open up my own school, but I was planning on taking some time off. I mean, I've been working, you know, since I was 15 for my instructor full time since I was 17 and senior year when I moved out and um, was wanting some time. So he invited me to go on tour, do some band managing, um, do some driving, whatever they needed kind of person and ended up crashing on his couch was planning on being here in san diego for a week and i was walking around uh, ocean beach a little little beach town we have here and i was saw a karate studio i was like you know it'd be fun to take a class i haven't done a formal class in about a month and a half too and uh ended up talking with the instructor before class he said you know come by a little bit later and um, i want to introduce you to somebody and that somebody ended up being nate and had a conversation and here we are uh, it was kind of serendipitous in uh, not so many words nice and how did that turn to a school and and working together and all that uh, i was running uh, my program uh, as i as i mentioned we were talking before i was sharing space with competitive cheer gym uh, which, by the way, any listeners out there trying to figure out a place to start a studio, if you can find uh, a cheer gym, that floor makes a very fun and entertaining floor to train martial arts on because they're a spring-based floor. So falls are no problem on those floors. Uh, we, I was actually running uh, martial arts classes for homeschool students for their PE requirement. And uh, that was my 100% of my student base. And then we started an after school program uh, with a local elementary. And my program was growing and growing. And Eric was helping me teach some of those classes as well as teaching a cardio kickboxing class for my fitness program. And we kind of hit a plateau of where we could be sharing that space, you know, with not having any evening classes at all. And uh, as he'd said, he'd always intended to open a school. So uh, we sat down and talked for a while. and. I said, you know, I'm ready to try to make a go of my own location and renting my own space. But, you know, financially, that's going to be tough. So it was either bring on a partner, bring on an investor or go massively in debt. And a partner was definitely the best option. And Eric was in a position he could come in and help. And, and so here we are today. Right on. And so what did that look like? What did that transition from daytime classes to you know, that format and, and that expansion look like, you know, and, and here's why I ask, you know, we often have people listening who maybe they're not actively running a school or even necessarily actively planning on starting a school. But I think for most martial artists, you think about it, you think about what would I do if, and so talking about some of these early sort of seed times, can be really impactful, really interesting to the folks we have listening. You know, and honestly, we're still in that position. You know, like I was telling you, we, we just moved into our own location uh, May 1st, and uh, we're still trying to fill those evening classes. You know, our afternoon class for our homeschool program is still super uh, strong and healthy, but now we're seeing some of those kids for extra classes start to come there. And, um, we know it's summer, which can, always, can be a challenge for schools. We have another summer camp coming up next week, which kids are enjoying. 
but it's, uh, it's just being persistent. And we know, you know, part of the reason why we wanted to make that transition is our after school program, we had kids as aging out of that program and we hated to lose them and not continue training. So, you know, it's kind of like with martial arts, you just have to stay persistent and keep working. You know, like if it's, you know, just like in any martial arts, if the technique doesn't work, you need to step back and see why it's not working. But right now we're just being confident and patient that, you know, the more we're here, the more people will find out and the more of those classes will fill. And we're content right now teaching a couple kids, you know, a couple nights a week. And then we train some ourselves still. And I think that's a big key as well is to make sure you still train and use that time valuably. Mm. So how did you approach the discussion of what you were going to teach? Recognizing, I assume you recognized at some point that you didn't want to teach separate curriculums. I mean, that was, that was probably a conversation early on. Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it was, uh, you know, I'd had my program going, uh, before I met Eric and I was using a Shotokan base and, uh, upon meeting him could tell his skills were exceptional. And, uh, I mean, you've discussed it before, you know, like, I think once you're experienced martial arts, like artists, like once you learn how to learn a form, learning another form isn't a daunting task. And, you know, if a good forward stance is a good forward stance. And so he was able to help me with that. And, and even once we formed the partnership, you know, we have students who've been training with me for several years, and it was going to be tough to change them. So I think it was pretty easy and open to say that we were at least Eric seemed to be that we were going to stick with the Shotokan base, but then there was aspects that I definitely wanted him to pass on to our students. So I think just keeping that, that discussion open um, and the, just that conversation going, even in front of our students, sometimes, you know, sensei Nate will, you know, share, share something or show something. And um, I might chime in with, you know, this is where I came from or how I went about it. But, you know, what works works. And when we're able to train it and show it in front of the students, I think they have even a greater appreciation for um, what we're doing. Because e even some techniques in, in a specific style, you know, you're going to have some differences, but depending on your body type, your physical limitations and, you know, making things work. So, um, you know, if something doesn't work one way, you know, we'll be able to go back and forth and maybe find, find the right combination for that student. Um, but I think just being open and honest. And I, as I mentioned before, his, you know, humility, I, I try to come in with the same humility and just, you know, let, let's talk about it. Let's see why this works. Why wouldn't it work and not sticking to any specific dogma of it has to be this way because this is what was said. Let's find something that works and that's going to be useful for the, you know, the task at hand. So what I'm hearing is it's, it's actually pretty organic and the students are not only observant of it, but maybe even participants and how you're working out some of these things. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and it, has that caused any problems? Uh, no, surprisingly. And that's, um, you know, we have some other friends who've taken over some schools or who started working with different instructors. You know, and even me, when I started teaching at a Tong Sudo school coming from Shotokan, you know, the forms are very similar, but very different. And, uh, you know, it can be a bit of a, a battle of like no it has to be this way and uh i don't know maybe that helped me in preparation of being open to any input eric gives but you know like i said his his talents are exceptional so you know who am i going to argue with someone who kicks honestly look better than my kicks so who am i going <laughs> to argue about kicks with him so <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> i would imagine that it, it's a much easier process when you recognize the the goals are similar, right? And you both mentioned humility and you're both speaking very highly of each other. And that's, that's a different kind of collaboration. It's a very open and, and I think the word that's coming up for me is selfless, that it sounds like what is most important is arriving as, at what works best for you and for your students, not what makes either of you look good. I don't imagine that you're keeping score or anything like that. Right. I think that's even something um, when we were lifting earlier, to put it shortly, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to be right, but I want to get it right, um, is is something that I try to keep, keep
keep in my mind, you know, what, what am I trying to accomplish? Am I trying to gain something personal or a little bit of ego out of this? Or am, am I truly after what, what's most beneficial for our clients or ourselves and our students? Yeah. And I think it, and it, like he said, it boils down to how are we going to progress and advance our students? And that's, you know, another reason why we each train now in pure Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, we both come from a background with, as Eric described, more stand-up jiu-jitsu. Mine was very weapon-based, you know, a lot of, you know, a scream a stick base for your training. But now we're both, and it's fun for us, we're both putting on white belts, going to class, you know, having fun. But it's, a lot of it is, you know, also to make ourselves better, but then in turn to make our students better and to keep our students more well-rounded and give them as much knowledge and capability as possible. I can certainly see the value in, in adding additional stuff, additional material to what you're able to offer to your students. But I'm also wondering if there's benefit for the two of you as not only instructors, but school owners here in that you you now have a shared experience. Your entire martial arts career up until the point you were working together was really separate. You know, it was, it was quite different, in fact, as you've both described it. But now here's something that you're working on at the same time, in the same place, learning from the same people. And it gives you, uh, I guess we could say, some common ground. Yeah, it, it does. And it's, you know, it's fun. Like, you know, we'll go, like we trained last night, pretty, you know, every class is extremely hard training at our jujitsu school that we train at. And um, it was takedown night. So working on takedowns and uh, then of course, you know, training grappling at the end. And then a lot of what we'll do is share with each other, you know, cause we still do have our, our traditional form space and we'll be like, Oh, how can we pull a move from a form to help reinforce this for our training? And, uh, right. you know, and I've told a lot of people, I think going, you know, having the humility to put back on a white belt and to learn and to drop the ego and go, I don't know everything. I have a lot I can still learn from any rank in this room. Helps give me patience teaching my students, you know, when they're not getting a technique, you know, even if it's a technique I've done a thousand times can, you know, do easily, you know, all it takes is for me to be in class at jujitsu and not get a technique that I'm seeing someone else do without effort to kind of connect the dot to go, you know what, step back and be patient when, you know, this, when your student is struggling, you know, or teach the technique maybe differently. Mm. And it is fun for us to learn together. And, oh, absolutely. It's and, been such fun experience. What's an example of something that maybe with, with this incorporation, this collaboration subject, you could have done differently? Ooh, that, that's, that's a good question. I think, I think if we had started from the very beginning, uh, you know, if I had, you know, if we had started zero students starting the collaboration together, we could have mapped out a more mixed curriculum of his forms, my forms, some of his, you know, weapons, um, maybe a more defined roadmap of what we want at each belt rank. Uh, we are associated uh, with another group of schools that has a curriculum that's still Shotokan based, which we're still t sticking to that as well. But since we, I was kind of running for some time, you know, it's kind of put the pressure on Eric to catch up in the Shotokan forms, but now. Um, sorry, not to offend any Shotokan listeners out there. We want to start a demo team and his forms are definitely much more flashy <laughs> and interesting to watch. You know, I come from 20 plus years of Shotokan that it's not quite the flash that some of the other styles have. It's quite all right. Hate mail can be directed to, to the two of you directly. <laughs> Leave me out of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, but uh, yeah, I'd have to. <laughs> not a problem no but I'd, I'd have to concur with him uh yeah having that a little bit more planned out probably would have been uh the most beneficial but him already being open with his students and coming in to see how he's interacted with the not only the students but the parents as well 
um, since we were teaching, you know, almost 100% kids at the time, um, they, they're, they've been very malleable and understanding and um, it, it would definitely have been probably a little bit easier um, for them to come across, you know, this is what it is and have that all laid out. But I think they're also having a fun experience knowing that moving into their own space, they're, they're at the forefront, they're going to be the leaders inside the school. And so they're, they're going to experience a, a little bit more taste of this and that, but it's uh, trying to make the best of that situation uh, currently. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you were to go through this process again, you know, would you do anything differently? Uh, I don't think so. I think I kind of like, as you know, you put it happened organically. And to me, it's almost more real world. You know, not everything is going to be planned to a T. You know, you can come, you know, even if you're talking about point sparring, you know, you can come in with a great plan and, you know, and it's not going to go to that plan. So I think with us, already having the mindset to be flexible and as Eric said, malleable and kind of move and go with the flow and evolve as we need to. I think that is a strength for us because we're going to be able to move and evolve and overcome, you know, kind of anything thrown at us because we're not stuck to this strict, you know, predetermined path. Okay. Okay. And so when you start looking out into the future, Right, because it sounds like you've got a pretty good thing going. You know, we've got two people with deep backgrounds, varied backgrounds, lending their experience and their skills together to the the benefit of their students, and I would assume each other, and then bringing in additional information. You know, keeping that white belt mentality we talk about on the show quite often. You know, it all sounds great. So, where is it heading? Uh Right now, our goal is, uh, you know, to we we cap our fitness classes and we cap our martial arts. So right now, it's headed to get to that cap. But what we want is our students to always keep that white belt mentality and continue to evolve. And you know, we always say that tell our students, you know, you realize when you get a black belt in our style, you know, that just means that, you know, you are truly ready to learn now. And we want our students to constantly challenge themselves and constantly try to pick up more skills. And, and for us, you know, we are both going, you know, for black belt rank in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And, you know, in most schools, that takes eight to 10 years or more. So we have that path in front of us. And I have a lot of cook school to learn. You know, and, you know, Eric's got some more Shotokan to learn. But together, I think we're going to build a, a solid school of disciplined, focused, hardworking students who also have a lot of fun because, as we tell everybody, you know, for us, nothing is off the table. You know, if you came to visit and were like, you know, oh, you know, I'm experienced in point fighting and I do a little point fighting, our kids are going to be fine and be comfortable with that. If a judo instructor comes in for the day and wants to work throws, you know, our kids are experienced with throws and they're going to have fun with that. You know, when our jujitsu professor comes in and wants to work jujitsu, they're experienced with that and have fun with that. Are they top level at any one thing? No, but at least they're familiar. And then I think that helps us, you know, if you're thinking from a business standpoint, retention, because there's a lot of information for us to still learn and pass on and a lot for them to learn and get better at. And then once they've been here for a while, maybe they gravitate to judo or they gravitate to karate or they gravitate to jiu-jitsu. And maybe that's where they turn their focus, you know, years from now. And that's fine. I want to give them the opportunity to pursue and, you know, just, you know, with its, my, my personal opinion, it's many flaws, you know, the education system, I, I want them to have a elementary understanding of how to, how to do stand up, how to do takedowns and how to do groundwork and creating an environment where it's okay to ask, can I do a little bit more of that? Um, and not shying away because one of us is more comfortable or less comfortable 
with that aspect of the martial arts. Um, you know, I, I want a, a common communal ground for an, a community of martial artists who are willing to share and, and push each other to their expertise and work on their weak points. Nice. Nice. Have, have, and let's see, I, I'm, I'm forming the question. Okay, here we go. I have heard some martial arts schools speak that they've had difficulty when people inquire as to what is taught if they have a blended style like this. You know, when people call up off the street, they're looking, you know, what do you teach? Oh, we teach such and such karate, or we teach such and such taekwondo, or this flavor of kung fu. How do you answer that question? You know, it's it's an answer. Uh, you know, the the other you know some of our other partner schools teach a blended style as well. So I've had experience the last few years, and even my original school, our our Shotokan was very. Uh, it wasn't pure. I'm totally honest with that part. Um, how we always do is we kind of break it down. You know, we teach a little bit of all of it. It's not, you know, we break it down to a rough percentage. Uh, Eric breaks it down to a good percent takedowns. Break it down to the parents, you know, because in real life, you're not going to be, you know, in real life, there's no rules of, oh, you can only do this one thing, you know, if you were truly to defend yourself. And, you know, we're just kind of honest that, you know, especially with a child you don't want their only known way of defending something if someone shoves them is front kicking them in the face you know you want them to be able to grab a kid hold a kid and take a kid down and hold them mm -hmm. you know and that's where our main focus with our takedowns are you know grab the kid take them and hold them because that to me is a better alternative than a beautiful front kick to the face um so you know we kind of ask what it is you know the parents are looking for you know, I'm sure you've seen in your experience, most of the time their parents are looking for the discipline, the focus, you know, a physical activity, you know, get them up and moving away from, uh, you know, an iPad, you know, or a tablet and uh, giving them the respect and, you know, now, you know, community and communication. So um, I guess I've been an Eric Meyer, I've been in the business long enough to know that I don't think most of the time they really know what they're looking for they may have some idea but you know i think the average person couldn't probably tell you the difference between shotokan karate ishinru and shorinru or even tong sudo so i guess we try to show the benefits and what we're teaching by them having a class and seeing it first person if that makes sense it does. And that's, that's kind of the gist of what I've heard most school owners respond with that, you know, it's an opportunity for educating the, the prospect. We want to think about it from a sales process. The idea that, hey, maybe you did call up looking for this thing, but really you're not looking for that thing most of the time. You're looking for what you believe is the way to achieve that thing. You know, you don't need Shotokan karate to learn respect. You don't yeah. need... Taekwondo and any particular style of Taekwondo to learn how to kick necessarily. So right. to have those conversations becomes, becomes important. All right. Yeah. I think that lays the, you know, the groundwork for you know, good communication with the parents and um, usually teaches them something. Uh, yeah. I would echo what you said. And, you know, the only time I've ever had somebody specifically looking for a style is maybe a parent that, you know, grew up doing, a taekwondo and that's that's the you know jargon they're familiar with um so it's it's a good opportunity to just be open and here, here's what we do and if you're looking for something let's discuss why we do or don't do that and make an informed decision from there do you guys have a name for the style uh otw united martial arts okay that's the name of the school correct okay so you don't have some some funky um collection of of we, syllables that you it's not shoda keto uh, no, no so it's, are, it's, uh, it's not a, <laughs> yeah. a hoof long dung yeah. I, I, yeah I i enjoy those names and sometimes they get really long yeah and they're fun to say yeah uh right. we are affiliated with a group of schools here in san diego 
Uh, Doshi Mark Colangelo founded a style that is, is recognized by, uh, you know, the Japanese Federation, uh, Goju Bujitsu. Um, Go, because there was five uh, who helped him, you know, establish the base of the style. And, uh, you know, he's ranked in Shotokan Judo and Jiu-Jitsu as well. And so he, he's, he believed that the three styles incorporated in the school that Eric mentioned, uh, Setting Sun Dojo here in Ocean Beach, is where we met. And, and I met the group from Studying Sun uh, through a local tournament here. Uh, I was teaching at the Kondo School. So if you had to pinpoint the style, that's what it would be. But uh, with Eric's Korean background and even now more of our mind of his fluid movement, it's, uh, I guess that would be the style, but it's still very much Eric Nate, so. <laughs> yes, I like that I name like even it. better. Yeah. Eric Nate, yo. You should make up some certificates with that. Yeah. We're working it. Well, I'll send the presses. <laughs> I dig it. Now I'm I'm curious because whenever people talk about this idea of, of blending martial arts, inevitably we end up on the subject of Bruce Lee and Jeet Kundo. Tends to happen a lot. Are either of you fans or have you read his work to the philosophies? of Jeet Kune Do, you know, creep into your thoughts at all as you're navigating this? Uh, I mean, I know for me, I was actually telling Eric yesterday, you know, we were looking over the list of questions you asked, and I'm like, it's hard pressed not to me personally be a, you know, I'm at that age too where, you know, Bruce Lee was prominent, you know, after his death. And when you read his philosophies and you read his mentality, you know, and like, mind like water, you know, you know, and take in what works for you, it's, it's really hard to deny that that is, to me, a good path. Because he's just saying, take what works for you, you know, and take what works. And if it doesn't work, get rid of it. And, and so I'm, you know, honestly, a huge fan of Bruce Lee and always have been and really enjoy his philosophical viewpoint of a lot. Agreed. All right. Right on. And, you know, here we have another episode and, and I wasn't thinking of it in this way, but we found a way to talk about Bruce Lee. It's almost all of them. I would say. More than 90%. You end up with just some, some little mention. Here we are quite a few years closer to 50 years after his death still the most prominent martial artist that's a legacy and, and it is you know and you'd have to you have to consider and think you know like if he was still around you know his input you know on like say the ufc for instance you know what would his thoughts be and you know i admit i'm old enough jeremy i'm not sure your age i remember ufc one i remember getting going to my instructor's house to watch ufc one you know on pay-per-view mm. and you know, that was the original of the epitome, right? What are is better? Let's throw everybody in a ring and do a tournament for the night. You know, so I would always thought it'd be interesting to hear his take on the UFC. Mm, absolutely. I remember when it happened, you know, I was still, I was still, I'm, I'm 40 now. So I was young when it happened, but I, I have been lucky enough to, uh, to have a conversation with Bill Wallace about it. So almost, almost as good. Yeah, almost as good. <laughs> Is being there myself. And for those of you that don't know, Bill Wallace was one of the commentators for UFC one. Good old super foot. Oh, yes. He's the man. I think we I think we each have separately you took you took with Maya, correct? The his seminar? Yeah, I've worked with him on a few occasions. That guy yeah, is myself as well. So. And uh the Jeter Kitas too. So there's yeah. some really still still some really good information and some contemporaries of guys who were in of that era and uh yeah. Yeah, just super cool uh, getting to talk with them about about the Bruce. Stuff that works still works. Yes. <laughs> right. right. All right. Well, if people want to find your school or maybe look you up individually on social media, how would they do that? Uh, on Track Wellness, uh, which goes back to uh, when I established the business originally as predominantly a fitness business, uh, but we felt it still fit which translated into the OTW United Martial Arts. 
the ontrackwellness.com, uh, on track wellness on Instagram, uh, on track wellness on Facebook, uh, is the easy way to find us. Uh, you'll see not just a lot of fun martial arts stuff, but fitness as well. Uh, pretty much any sp- aspect of fitness too. Hiking, um, you know, martial arts, lifting, power lifting. Uh, we actually, as Eric mentioned, uh, we power lift as well. Uh, our, our studio is not just a martial arts studio. We have a functional fitness area. Uh, we have a bag room and we have a full uh, weight room for heavy lifting and power lifting. Oh man, I want to come hang out with you guys. Yeah, come, come <laughs> you're, by you're, anytime. You're you're, you're 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 like smushing Jeet Kune Do philosophy with with CrossFit <laughs> philosophy to yes. end up where you're at. It's like do a bunch of everything all the time. <laughs> exactly. Which kind of describes my workout routine. It's it's yeah. what am I doing today? Oh, this cool. <laughs> And a lot of eating to back it up, you know? Yes. yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the fun part, right? We work out so right. we can eat. Exactly. exactly. And we power lift so we can justify eating even more. Right. Exactly. Bodybuilding, you've got to eat less. Power lifting, you have to eat more. Oh, yeah. That, that's the excuse for a lot of peanut butter goes down <laughs> at the studio. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, guys, this has been a ton of fun. I want to thank you for coming on. A little bit different discussion so listeners i hope you got something out of this and i hope you check out what they're doing it's it's certainly not an uncommon uh, thing in today's martial arts even even if we're not calling it blended it's for most of us what we learned was blended and i think that that's awesome it is and i and i i hope what it it does is um you know for me you know being in you know going into my mid 40s and deciding to put a white belt on again, I think it's it's easy for us to stay in our comfort zone, even though we talk to our students about getting out of their comfort zone. I think it's good for us to continually put ourselves outside of our own comfort zone, you know, and strive to learn and grow and evolve. And I still compete, I'm competing in jujitsu and traditional martial arts still. And I think it's good for us as school owners, as instructors, and as just martial artists to still dabble have fun learn and grow and you know not just get stuck with like nope this is the way it has to be so that's what i would love to see and anyone out there san diego you in the surrounding areas more than welcome to always come check out hang out lift weights kick around take a class doors always open absolutely i thought we covered some good ground today and certainly I learned a number of things. If I ever end up owning my own martial arts school again, which is not on the radar, but who knows? Life's crazy. I've got some stuff in my back pocket that I can refer to thanks to Sensei Nate and Sensei Eric. So gentlemen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being so open with me and with the audience. If you want to find the show notes with the transcript and everything else we've got, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can leave your comments over there in the show notes page. Remember, this is episode 417. But if you've got some private comments you'd like to share, you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Whistlekick.com is the place to go for the stuff that we make and the other things that we're involved in. And don't forget the code PODCAST15 saves you 15% on sweatshirts and tees and tank tops and hats and uniforms and gear and the list goes on. Check out the store. If you haven't been over there lately, I added some new stuff not too long ago. Our social media is at Whistlekick. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook are our primary channels. And that's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.